The Lord be with you. That usually gets people to be quiet and sit down. Um, so we're grateful to have you here. As Jared said, we at Luther House have been stagnant for uh, several years, haven't done anything. Um, and so it's good to be called back into action. Um, and you know, uh, but uh, we're also grateful for the support of people saying, hey, you know, we want to hear what you have to say. And that, that doesn't happen very often. So we're happy to be here. Uh, we're also happy to introduce you to uh, our new colleague, Nick Hopman, who's joined us in the middle of the summer. And obviously, you just heard Lars Olson, some of you know him already. He actually has survived this a year now. So he started a year ago. And so, for, so we're grateful to have both of them on board. So as you can see, we're expanding in, in capacity to work with people. And uh, there's a lot of news about Luther House that we've been, you've probably been seeing. But we're going to not talk about that right now, but we're going to have Nick come forward and give his first presentation. But for those people that are online, there is a uh, chat that Sarah is going to be monitoring. So if you have questions, um, you can put those in and we'll uh, raise those questions to the presenters as today and tomorrow goes. So, but uh, with that said, uh, Nick Hopman uh, is going to come up and be our first presenter. So thanks, Nick. Good to see everyone. Uh, I was told to mention Facebook. If you're on Facebook Live, you can do uh, questions and comments. We've got a couple of proctors there that will relay anything that they think is very relevant. Feel free to stop me. I'm going to stop about halfway through for questions specifically, but if there's something burning we have to get to before that, please let me know. The Evangelical Lutheran Church, of course, in part, is named after Martin Luther. And of course, it's well known that Luther was an Augustinian monk, a friar. Friars were creations of the late Middle Ages who were responsible for doing a lot of preaching in various circumstances. But then something happened, and Luther was no longer a friar, but a Lutheran. Martin Luther becoming Lutheran. How did he not see that one coming? At the time, of course, uh, papal apologists gave their own reasons for why Luther gave up his monastic vows. Johannes Coplius, one of his first enemies, one of his first opponents, who Duke George and neighboring Ducal Saxony would soon hire to be his court chaplain, he said that Luther started the whole Reformation because he didn't like being a monk, and the reason he didn't like being a monk is that he liked women too much. But these days, all historians, Lutheran, Catholics, and atheists alike, all say that Luther was an extremely good monk, diligent in prayers, duties, and piety. He was so good at disciplining his flesh that after about 15 years or so as a monk, he was sick for the remaining 40 years of his life because he had abused his body so badly in the monastery. So what happened? If Luther was such a great friar, why did he eventually stop being a friar and become a Lutheran? Usually people don't quit doing something that they're very good at. We have no historical record of Stradivarius saying, well, enough with the violins, I've always wanted to become a banker. <laughs> so what happened with Luther? Did he love potlucks and egg bags so much that he just had to be Lutheran? Well, in addition to being a disciplined friar, Luther was also extremely intelligent. And so he was selected by his Augustinian order to study the sacred scriptures, become a professor, a teacher of the Bible. And in the Bible, as Luther would famously recount later, he ran up against Romans 1, 16 and 17, where the Apostle Paul wrote, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Jew, to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Now there's no better way to show the importance of this for Luther than to read his own words reflecting back on the great change that he underwent at the end of the 1510s. He's discussing in this passage I'm about to read this phrase, the righteousness of God in Romans 1.17, and he's describing how he did not like this phrase. 
Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners, and secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God and said, as if indeed it is not enough that miserable sinners, eternally lost through original sin, are crushed by every kind of calamity, by the law of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, without having God add pain to pain by the gospel, and also by the gospel threatening us with his righteousness and wrath. Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. Nevertheless, I beat importunately upon Paul at that place, Romans 1.17, most ardently desiring to know what St. Paul wanted. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words. Namely, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed as it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous live, by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness with which merciful God justifies us by faith, as it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. There a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself to me. Thereupon I ran through the scriptures from memory. I also found in other terms an analogy as the work of God, that is, the work God does in us, the power of God with which he makes us strong, the wisdom of God with which he makes us wise, the strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. And I extolled my sweetest word with a love as great as the hatred with which I had before hated the word righteousness of God. Thus that place in Paul was for me truly the gate to paradise. We see that there could have been hardly anything more essential than these two verses for Luther that eventually caused him to flee his monastic vows, having already been set free and having entered paradise by faith alone. This passage also gives us a feeling for how Lutheran theology works, or to say the same thing, how language about God in the Bible works. God's righteousness is that by which he makes us righteous. His power makes us powerful. In other words, God is active. He is not sitting back passively, holding up his ruler, holding up his law, holding up his legal righteousness to see if we are righteous or strong or wise. And of course we are not righteous or strong or wise. But God takes the initiative himself, sending his son to die and rise and giving us this good news, this gospel as Paul calls it, so that we have something to believe in, something to trust, something that actually creates faith out of unbelief. Isaiah talked about the righteousness of God this way in the 11th chapter. The Lord shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, meaning his righteousness will fight for the poor. And he will decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be a belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. Isaiah is telling us here that God's righteousness is not a legal standard we must live, into, live up to. Rather, God's righteousness is his battle dress, 
It's what he used to fight for his chosen people, Israel, against their enemies. And he does it for you. God's righteousness does not sit back passively watching and listening. The Lord shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. His righteousness is not passive, it is most active. It fights for us and saves us. We are passively saved by God's active righteousness. Tomorrow we're going to hear more about how this righteousness of God, how his activity has played itself out in some of the great events of the Bible. Here we note that as Paul is defining what the righteousness of God is, he is quoting from the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk 2.4. The one who is righteous by faith shall live. Paul makes his whole argument here in Romans based on this one sentence from the Old Testament. The one who is righteous by faith shall live. Faith creates righteousness. Faith creates life. And faith is precisely what Adam and Eve lost in the first place in the Garden of Eden. God said, don't eat from this one tree, and Adam and Eve believed him, so they didn't eat from the tree. They believed until the snake deceived him, and then they did not believe God anymore. But we'll get a bit more specific here in order to define belief faith. Adam and Eve believed God. They believed they would die if they ate the forbidden fruit, just as God told them. The devil's deception, on the other hand, was to say, no, you won't die. God is lying to you. But he also told them why God was allegedly lying to them. He said, God knows that when you eat the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, God knows that when you eat of the tree, you'll no longer be his creature, but you'll become your own gods. The devil convinced them that God forbade them to eat from the tree, not for their own good, but in order to hurt them, in order to protect his prerogative as God, and prevent Adam and Eve from gaining that prerogative for themselves. The devil, in his scheming, convinced Eve that God's word, don't eat from the tree, that that word was actually scamming her and Adam. Now, there is one essential thing to never do with a schemer, never do with a scammer, and that is trust them. If you trust a scammer, everything is lost. And that is the best explanation, the best synonym, the best definition of the word belief and the word faith that we encounter here in Romans 1 and Habakkuk 2. Faith means trust. He who is righteous by faith, meaning he who trusts God, will live. Just as Adam and Eve would never have died in the first place if they had trusted God's word given to them for their own good, don't eat from this tree or you will die. Whether Luther was writing or speaking in Latin, talking about faith, whether using the word fides, which we all know from sola fide, by faith alone, or whether he was using the Latin word fiducia, which properly means trust, or whether he was preaching or writing in German and using the word Glaube, faith, or Zufesisch, confidence, or Vertrauen, trust proper, the English word that is at the heart of what Luther always meant by faith is trust. It's always faith's fiduciary aspect, faith's trusting, that is central to what Luther means by faith alone. And, of course, just as he relates, he got this precisely from the Apostle Paul. When Paul is talking about faith, pistis, he means trust. And just as importantly, when Jesus Christ 
is talking about faith, this is what he means. This is what he means when he says to various characters in the gospel, your faith has saved you. In other words, Christ is telling people, you were correct to trust me. You can trust me. If you trust me, things will work out in the end. You were right, sinful woman who anointed my feet with your tears. You were correct to trust that I am the forgiveness of your sins. Your trust has saved you. You trusted in the right person, Mr. Blind Man. You trusted that I could give you sight. Your trust has given you sight. Your trust has saved you. And as we see in these stories, it is precisely when something is wrong that trust is the means of life itself. Faith gives life precisely out of death. When you are a sinful woman, trusting Christ goes against the feeling of your sins condemning you. When you are blind, trusting Christ goes against the darkness that you are always experiencing. The same was true in Habakkuk. God was encouraging people to have faith, to believe him, to trust him in the midst of a situation where it looked like there was no hope. This is what Luther meant in his discussion of the righteousness of God that goes together with faith. God's righteousness is that he saves his people in the midst of suffering. Just as he was promising his righteousness to the people in peril, the poor and the meek, as we read in Isaiah, God's righteousness fights for you in peril. And nothing is more dangerous to us, of course, than our own selves. And so God's righteousness creates us anew. It protects us from ourselves. It takes us who are unbelievers, untrusters, and turns us into trusters. He makes us righteous. He makes unrighteous sinners to be righteous in Christ by causing us to trust that Christ is our righteousness. He makes us who are dead in our sins to live in Christ who has beaten death. And he does this by faith alone. So this is what Romans 1, 16 through 17 is all about. And as we've seen, nothing could be more fundamental or even original in the historical sense to the evangelical Lutheran faith and church than this passage in Romans. Any questions at this point? Not something from Bookface. No? Oh, okay. I thought it was a yes nod. I'm Mr. just Speaker. wondering how Martin Luther got the definition of righteousness through the Catholic Church. What were they saying righteousness was, or how it's, you know, that how it became such a change in his understanding of what it really was? What was the Catholic Church preaching about it, teaching about it? Well, he certainly, he certainly got the hatred of the righteousness of God from what the Catholic Church was teaching. Um, because as he goes through in that first half of what I read, he, he was taught that God's righteousness is a measuring stick and you have to live up to it. And of course, the way the Catholic Church does it is to talk about the old law, as Luther mentioned, the Decalogue, which no one of course lives up to. And then they say, but now Christ has come to bring the new law. And the new law is even more difficult than the old law. So that's why he's hating it. Now, um, we don't want to overgeneralize too much. Of course, Luther gets this from the Bible, as I was saying. But he's also got Staupitz, who was especially Augustinian. And uh, Augustinians always seem to know a thing or two about grace and mercy. And so um, I'm sure Staupitz is helping him along here. Um, perhaps even uh, he gets he gets the act the activeness of God's righteousness a bit. I'm not sure about that, um, but he he's he's at the very least trying to get Luther to relax a little bit about all of his sins and say God is gracious. And you hear in that confession from Luther, 
this is how the merciful God, he's certainly hearing that God is merciful from his confessor, Staupitz. Sir? You said righteousness is not a legal term. Sure, but there is a legal term. All right, go ahead. You mentioned righteousness is not a legal term. And I just heard twice yesterday that it is. So I'm asking how or why is your interpretation of that? It certainly can be a, a legal term. It almost always is a legal term. But what, Paul, what Luther's discovering here is that that is not how Paul is using it in, in Romans 1, 16 and 17. So uh, that, that's more of why it's a confusion and why he has to beat upon St. Paul to figure out what Paul is talking about. Because human language itself is, is always tending towards the law. And so in the second half here, we're going to get into Romans 3, where Paul is going to talk about the righteousness of God apart from the law, irrespective of the law. My question is, is uh, Tom had asked about, you know, from his Catholic, you know, training and being uh, a monk, how he would come up with this kind of thinking. I, I mean, I, you know, Martin Luther was pretty mentally ill for quite a bit of his life. He wrestled terribly with just what are commonly uh, difficult situations. I mean, he was very depressed for quite a long time. And so, is it not that possibly his depression and, and his learning and what he, he was then trying to read to find salvation in the Bible, that in that wrestling that he, you know, became non-Catholic in the terms of what he was taught to be a good Christian? I don't know, I'm asking the question. Part, part of the reason that Luther is such a, good, such a good monk is he's especially honest. And so he says in there that his satisfaction is not satisfying God. He was being taught that he actually could satisfy God's wrath. And Luther says, uh, this doesn't work. He goes through great periods of spiritual struggles. Um, I, I'm not sure I would agree he was mentally ill, but I think we could definitely look at periods of his life and talk about him being depressed. Um, that, would, that would probably be fair enough. Depression is a form of illness. Well, it's a form of honesty. That's, that's true. And, and parts, part, you know, uh, some things that get called mental illness are probably, are probably honesty. Um, he, he's greatly disturbed. I, I, I completely agree with that. And that is, that is the means that God uses to, to break down his own, what he thought was his own righteousness. And so that's why he, he's confused. He says, though I was a monk that lived without reproach, uh, I hated God. <laughs> it wasn't that there was just a little imperfection in his faith. Monks are supposed to love God. And Luther says, the better the monk I became, uh, the more I hated God. Can you say a little bit about the relationship of uh, belief and trust in faith? You've talked about trust being a central component of faith and, and laid that out for us. To what degree does faith as belief interact with trust? Um, I might very well answer that question at the end here. Let me do the second half, and then if you still got that question, it's a great question but just for the sake of uh, not, not repeating. Lars, I noticed you had the light on up here at some point. This knob. This knob, all right, oh, thank you. Okay, well, in order to expand this discussion of faith of trusting, I'm gonna go a little ways ahead into Romans chapter three and read what uh, should be for all Lutheran churches the epistle reading every year on Reformation Sunday. 
And it's good that this is the epistle reading, even though Luther talks about Romans 1, 16 through 17. Romans 3, 19 through 28 uh, lays out a little more what Romans 1 puts so succinctly. Uh, here in Romans 3, Paul will tell us more about the gospel that we heard of in Romans 1, namely that it is a part from the law, irrespective of the law. The gospel does not respect the law. Here, Paul will give us a longer discussion of Christ's righteousness, God's righteousness that we heard in Romans 1. And here we'll find out more about this word faith that he mentions so often in Romans 1, 16 and 17. So here is Romans 3, 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, irrespective of law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works. No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith alone, apart from works prescribed as the law. Now I have begun to talk about faith as trust, and here we see how accurate an interpretation of Romans 1 this is, because here Paul is explaining this justification by faith that we Lutherans love to talk about so much. He's explaining that justification by faith deals precisely with matters of trust. Let me read just three verses from that epistle reading again. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed, it was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. It's to prove at the present time that he, God, is righteous. Now why would God be in the business of proving that he is righteous? Well, because it's not obvious. If you look around the world, it doesn't become obvious that there is an almighty God who is righteous. God's righteousness is not subject to the scientific method. You can't merely observe it with your eyes. And here we hear that this proving of his own righteousness has something to do with sins previously passed over. God is in a struggle to prove to the world that he is righteous. Paul is telling us here that apart from Christ, God has a credibility problem. Not only did God pass over the homes of the Jews through the blood of the lamb on the doorpost on the night when he freed them from Egypt, but he also has passed over sins previously committed. What God is doing with Christ on the cross has to do with sins previously committed. Now we see the passing over of sins all the time, of course. Sometimes people get punished for their sins, but more often than not, they don't. Sometimes people invade Afghanistan and Iraq and then retire to a beautiful ranch in Texas while thousands of Americans die 
and are maimed, to say nothing of what happened to the Iraqi and Afghani people. Certain people take millions of dollars from the communist Chinese government and Ukrainian oligarchs, and nothing ever happens to them. The sins are passed over. If God is the creator, and he is almighty, if he is truly omnipotent, as we Gentiles say about God, then where is his righteousness? This is what Paul is talking about here in Romans 3.26 and the end of 3.25. Now, our particular breed of Gentiles here in South Dakota, descended as we are linguistically from the Danes and the Angles and the Saxons that invaded Great Britain long ago, we have some trouble with this word righteousness because it's so foreign to us. We know it's in the Bible, and it probably has some kind of a strange meaning. Special, it's a special biblical word. Now, the Jews actually use the word righteousness, of course. And we'll see that even the Germans and the Scandinavians might understand this biblical word a little better than we do, because their form of Germanic languages uses their word for righteousness more often than we do. But we Anglo-Saxons uh, did not make the word righteousness one that we use in our everyday language. So as we continue to explore what this righteousness of God is, here's the solution. The word justice today, of course, is very popular. So when you see the word righteousness in the Bible, just think justice. And this is perfectly legitimate to do because in Greek, and even more importantly in Hebrew, as well as in Latin and German, as Luther is working through this, trying to figure out what the righteousness of God is, in all of these languages, righteousness and justice can be the same word. In Hebrew, we've got sadik, which can mean righteousness or justice. In Greek, we've got dikaiosune. This is what Paul actually writes in Romans 1.17 and Romans 3 in various places. In Latin, we've got justitia. You can see there our English word justice, but in Latin it can mean uh, righteousness. We talk about the justitia dei in Latin, the righteousness of God. And then in German, we've got gerechtigkeit. You can almost see the English word righteousness in there, uh, but in German it can mean justice just as much as righteousness. So what Paul is getting at here is where is God's righteousness? Where is God's justice in this world. When a government official advocates killing Gaddafi and turns Libya into a hellhole, what happens to them? They get promoted, of course. Does anyone get fired for the Afghanistan withdrawal debacle? No. Can you possibly trust that God is just and good and righteous when Lloyd Austin still has a job? Of course not. But Paul is telling us that this is precisely the problem that God is solving with Jesus on the cross. He's trying to make himself trustable. Christ is the way that God has chosen to deal with his credibility problem. Credibility, trustability. God has a problem with trustability. Therefore, Paul says, he put forward his own son. Nevertheless, we sinners always try to place our trust in the law and legal justice. We always think if we just go back to the law one more time, everything will be fine. Sure, communism has killed a hundred million people in the last century, but we just haven't done it right. Let's try it again. Or those of you who aren't so prone to communism think, oh sure, the world's going to hell, our country's going to hell, but if we could just get the right guy in charge of the law, maybe everything could be fixed. You know, we could call him uh, Kevin McCarthy. If we could just get Kevin McCarthy to be the Speaker of the House, finally there'll be some investigations and some justice in the land. Well, good luck with that. But our English-speaking official translators of the Bible are looking to go back and trust the law just as much as a hapless midterm voter. And our Calvinist anti-Lutheran Bible translators tell us 
that God solved his trustability problem with Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. So the NRSV is telling us that Christ is a sacrifice of atonement. He is what is called in scripture a sin offering. The sacrifice of atonement, of course, was conducted one day a year when the chief priest went in the Holy of Holies in the temple and sprinkled blood on top of the Ark of the Covenant on Yom Kippur, Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement. Paul tells us that God has passed over sins previously committed. He hasn't made people pay for their sins, but allegedly Paul is telling us that here, by putting Christ to death, Christ has paid the debt so you don't have to, and you can trust this. But this only leads to the question, what exactly is trust doing? How does faith play a role here? How exactly does this work? How does Christ's death balance the books? Can we see some math here to make sure that Christ hasn't let out, he hasn't forgotten to pay your penny or mine to the world's sin debt. Furthermore, debt and payment are always difficult categories to jive with trust. You see, generally when a debt is paid back, when a debt is paid, there's not a lot of trust involved. When you pay off your mortgage, your bank does not trust you. There's no point in trusting at that point. The trust comes with the giving of the loan, not the paying back. Payment is, of course, always a matter of law. But there is a certain amount of trust, I suppose, when the bank gives you the loan. They actually want to check with your employer and see if you actually make any money. They want to contact the credit agencies and see if you've been trustworthy in the past with loans. But when the debt is paid, there is no trust. When you pay off a debt, you do not need trust. What you need is a receipt. And receipts are the opposite of trust. If you perfectly trusted your bank or your grocery store, you could go your whole life never asking for a receipt. A receipt is a legal document. And the law is all about protecting you from your neighbor's injustice. Should the bank later unjustly say, you didn't pay us back, you can whip out your receipt and say, oh yes, I did. More to the point, we can't get a receipt for Christ's death because as Paul tells us here, we're supposed to trust in it. Christ's death is, quote, effective through faith, effective through trust. And receipts are the opposite of trust. So what do we need to go along with Christ's payment of our debt in order to make sure that the devil never steals it back from us? Perhaps we need an explanation for how his death pays our sins. Well, other translations try to explain this. They try to get into the nitty-gritty of how a sacrifice, a sacrifice of atonement might work. Even though scripture tells us over and over again that God is not a big fan of sacrifice. He only grudgingly went along with sacrifice because his people were jealous of the Gentiles. And they wanted to try out the Gentile theory that somehow the anger of the gods can be appeased by killing something. But sacrifice was never what God really wanted. But other translations, instead of calling Christ a sacrifice of atonement, they try to explain the sacrifice by calling Christ a propitiation, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, effective through faith. Propitiation is just a fancy word that means appeasement. God is appeased, mollified by Christ's blood. His wrath is quieted or calmed by Jesus' blood. But thankfully, neither sacrifice of atonement nor propitiation nor expiation or whatever the case might be in the translations 
None of them are a correct translation of what Paul actually wrote here in Romans 3 in Greek. The Greek word that is receiving the translation sacrifice of atonement or propitiation is hilasteria. Put it into the verse. Whom God put forward as a hilasteria by his blood, effective through faith. Now this strange word appears exactly twice in the New Testament, once in Romans 3.25 here, and once in Hebrews 9.5. And apparently Christian theologians have felt that a lot less is at stake theologically in Hebrews 9.5 than in Romans 3.25, because in, Ro in Hebrews 9.5, they always translate it correctly. And the correct translation is mercy seat. That's what you'll find in Hebrews 9.5 in the English Bible. And that, of course, is the correct translation in Romans 3.25 as well. Exactly how Martin Luther translated it in his Bible. In the Luther Bible, Christ is put forward as the Gnadenstuhl, the mercy seat. Christ is not a sacrifice of atonement or propitiation. He is a mercy seat. He is the place of God's mercy for you. This references the cover of the Ark of the Covenant where the Lord sat on the wings of the cherubim, the angels on top of the lid, and that was the place on the Day of Atonement that the chief priest would go and sprinkle the blood of the goat and the bull. The Septuagint is, of course, the Greek translation, the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew. And when the Septuagint came around, the Hebrew word kaporeth, it translated with the Greek word hilasterion, which is what Paul is picking up in Romans 3. So, whom God put forward as a mercy seat by his blood, effective through faith. But now maybe some of you are out there thinking, now wait a minute, is the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant where the sacrifice of atonement was made every year, is the mercy seat really that much different than the sacrifice of atonement itself? The mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant sounds pretty sacrifice of atonement T. Is there really that big of a difference between these two translations? Well, in order to understand how big of a difference there is, we also then need to look at the blood in Romans 3.25. Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. I'm supposed to reread that one. No, no one has ever figured out exactly how sacrifice works. There's been a lot of ink spilled over it, and no one has come to a solution. Now, I'll tell you why it is that no one can figure out exactly how sacrifice works. And that is because sacrifice is stupid. And it doesn't work. That's why no one can ever figure out how it works. It is a human idea. It is enthusiasm, as Lutherans would say, something that Gentile sinners dreamed up in order to please God, to appease him and please him, even though God did not say sacrifice to me until his own chosen non-sacrificing people pleaded and begged that he would actually give them a sacrificial system. But one thing that everyone agrees on is the direction of sacrifice. The direction of sacrifice is always up. The famous sacrifice of the Mass taught by the Roman Church is the sacrificing of Christ up to God. And so one prays in the canon of the Mass that God would accept our sacrifice of Jesus. And of course, Catholics did not invent it, this. They just give us the more Christian, nicer, more Catholic version of sacrifice. The Aztecs, as they were cutting people's hearts out of their chest, had the same general idea that the person was being sacrificed to the gods. 
a burnt offering in the Bible is offered up to God. When you burn something, the smoke goes up. It does not go down. And so, when our translators preach to us, Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith, they attach the blood to the sacrifice of atonement because it is somehow the blood in a sacrifice that allegedly pleases God. Blood is offered to him. God gives life, blood is life, so we give the blood, the life blood back to God. But thankfully, Christ has come. As Paul says, God put forward Christ to stop all of this nonsense. He's come to put a stop to the killing and to give life. He's come to put a stop to the alien work of God, death, and instead give God's proper work, life. He's come to show us that God does not want blood and life from us, but that life actually goes the opposite direction. Life goes down. It comes from God above to his creatures below. He who is righteous by faith shall live. And thankfully, sacrificing blood to God has nothing to do with what Paul actually wrote in Romans chapter 3. He wrote that Christ is a mercy seat from God, and then Paul explains how this mercy seat actually has mercy on you and me. He answers that Christ is a mercy seat by faith in his blood. The word blood in Romans 3.25 is not attached to the sacrifice of the law, the sacrifice of the atonement, a propitiation. Instead, faith is attached to the blood. The blood is attached to faith. Here we see the second half of the verse in Greek. Whom God put forward as a hilisterion, a mercy seat, dia pisteos, through faith, ento autum haimate, in his blood. In the NRSV version that I've been reading as our standard translation, the order of the three big nouns here, mercy seat, blood, faith, that's, that is the order. Sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. But here we see in the Greek that the faith and the blood are reversed. The blood is not attached to the mercy seat. The blood is separated from the mercy seat by faith. Whom God puts forward as a mercy seat, dia pisteos, by faith. Ento autom haimati, in his blood. Here it is with the Greek removed to not confuse. Whom God put forward as a mercy seat by faith in his blood. This is the proper translation of this crucial point in all of Scripture. Well, what's the significance? You switch it now and around, does that really make that much of a difference? Well, here we see that the blood is not a sacrifice of the law offered up to God. Instead, it flows down off the cross to us. Christ's blood is where our trust belongs. It's the place where God actually has mercy on us. It's not where we appease God, but where God becomes trustable for you and me. So here's some images from Lutheran art of Christ's blood, not flowing up to heaven, of course, but flowing down where it actually belongs, saving us. Here's the famous Weimar altar piece by Lucas Cranach Jr. And here's a close up here. He shows Christ's blood flowing out of his side onto his dad's head. Lucas Cranach Sr. was apparently a heck of a senior uh, sinner. And then uh, something happened very late in his life, and his son memorialized it by putting his dad here, receiving Christ's blood for the forgiveness of his sins, 
You can see that he probably squeezed him in there between John the Baptist and Martin Luther after he'd already painted them. Uh, in the 17th century, Lutherans developed a form of art called confessional pictures. They pictorially depicted the uniqueness of the Lutheran church over and against the other Christian confessions. For instance, if you look hard enough, you can see somebody doing private confession to distinguish the Lutheran church from other Protestants. They almost always had a choir in them because Lutherans were the only Protestants that kept choirs. But at the heart of all of these pictures is Christ's blood coming down. Here it is coming down into the chalice that's going to be served for communion. Here's another confessional picture from Leipzig replete with various heretics looking on there on the left side of the picture. But there you can see private confession. In this one, some of the blood of Christ is going off and shooting onto the baby being baptized there. Other ones used water coming out of his side to baptize the baby. But this one's got the blood going there, as well as down into the communion chalice. So this all makes kind of common Christian sense, if you think about it, which direction the blood is actually going. The good news is that God did not spare his own son, but gave him up to a bloody death for your sake. And so Paul can say in Romans chapter 8, what then are we to say about these things? He's been talking about the suffering of Christians, the suffering of those who trust in Christ. If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for us all, Will he not with him also give us everything else? If God did not spare his own son from a bloody death on the cross, won't he give everything else to us that we might need in a perilous situation, in a time of temptation? In other words, Paul is asking the rhetorical question here in Romans 8, in the blood of God's son, isn't God trustable? Because of Christ's death, can't we trust him? Yes, he is trustable, precisely in Christ's blood. To sum up the differences between our English Bible translators and what I'm trying to teach here based on Luther's translation of Romans 3.25, the summary is this. If Christ is a sacrifice of atonement by blood, then the sacrifice of the Mass is, of course, correct. The blood must be given to God to appease his anger against our sin. But if instead Christ is a mercy seat, if he's God's place of mercy by faith in his blood, then the Lord's Supper is not a sacrifice, but a sacrament. Then it is not a sacrifice, but a testament. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Christ did not say, this is my blood shed for God for the payment of sins. No, he said, this is my blood shed for you, sinners, for the forgiveness of your sin. So here's the true translation, whom God put forward as a mercy seat by faith in his blood, and there's Luther's German, just to check we're doing it correctly. Welchen Gott hat vorgestellt, the one God stood forward zu einem Gnadenstuhl as a mercy seat, durch den Glauben, by faith in seinem Blut, in his blood. Paul is saying right here that God is trustable in spite of all the unpunished sins in the world. And, spoiler alert, these sins will be punished eventually. The wages of sin is death, and that's where we're all headed. Jesus' death does not somehow substitute for yours and mine in such a way that we get to avoid it. It's not just the political figures that I named are sinners. It's all of us. He tells us in Romans 1, Romans 2, and Romans 3 that none of us is righteous according to the law. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law, comes the knowledge of sin. The punishment for the sins 
that God has previously passed over will come in good time. But it is not his punishment that makes him trustable. We can't say, well, he hasn't punished some sin, so I don't trust him. And then on the last day, when everyone's dead, say, ah, it's about time. Now I can finally trust God. That is not the trust, the faith that Paul is talking about. We do not trust the law or its wrath or its death. Your trust is not in the law's previous passing over of sins or future execution of sins. Instead, as Paul tells us, God is doing this to make himself trustable in the present time, right here and now, by giving his son and his blood to us for the forgiveness of our sins. You see, we too are in a desperate situation, like all the characters in the Old Testament. We're in an even more desperate situation than Daniel was when he was in the lion's den. The lions could scar his flesh, they could stop his heart, they could spill his blood. But we, on the other hand, are eternally condemned sinners. But in our desperate situation, God's righteousness has fought for us. His righteousness is that he gave his son up to death for you, and thereby gave you blood that you can actually trust. Blood that does not pay for your sins, but forgives them. Blood that will not let you down in the end. And this means that trust can cling to God in the midst of anything. In the midst of the horrible things that Paul lists in Romans 8, or if the devils take our house, goods, honor, child, or spouse, though life be wrenched away, they cannot win the day. The kingdom's ours forever because we have Christ's blood to cling to. Your faith, your trust, is not in some theory about heavenly accounting books and the balance of sin and blood, the balance of credits and debits. Faith is not a matter of accepting correct theories. You do not have the power to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior by agreeing to a medieval monastic theory about Christ's payment for your sin. For some reason, many Lutherans and Protestants have claimed that this payment theory invented by Anselm, a Benedictine Italian-British monk in the 12th century, must be the true Protestant understanding of Christ's death. But Accepting an explanation is the opposite of trust. Trust is not relying on a theory that you can mentally assimilate. Trust is trusting something you can't control, namely, Almighty God. But here you've heard the real deal from Luther and Paul, and so you know that faith is not the mental acceptance of a theory, but is instead trust. And in this world, Trust is in a constant battle for its own life. Faith itself is never strong enough to win this battle. Faith's only power in temptation, in suffering, faith's only power there is its inherently clingy nature. Faith is always sticking to something. But of course, it can always be in the wrong thing. But here, Paul is telling us that God stood forward his son to give our faith something to cling to that won't let us down, that will actually forgive our sins, and thereby we shall live, as Habakkuk put it. This is the proclamation of people who trust that God is good, and he is almighty, and he is just, because we trust that his righteousness is to keep his promise to us. This is his righteousness, and it saves you. All right. More questions? Early on when you were talking, you were talking about this wonderful world, word, justice. I have no clue what justice means. I was trying to filter out is justice synonymous with judgment? Excellent question. 
it often is. Like when this gentleman was saying that righteousness often is a legal word on the rare occasions that we actually use that word. It, it, it very well could be judgment. Let me give you a definition here that I think uh, we can use both when we're talking about judgment and what Paul is talking about when he talks about the righteousness of God slash the justice of God. Justice, this is a, and this is a popular way that we think about it, not the only way. Justice is getting what you have coming to you. Now, apart from Christ, what do you have coming to you? Judgment and death. But what Paul is telling us here is God is just. God will get you what you have coming to you. And here, in the trusting of Christ's blood, what you have coming to you is life. And so, as Habakkuk put it succinctly, he who is righteous by faith shall live. found it helpful to oh, oh sorry okay. have you found it helpful to define faith as trust uh, from Luther's explanation of the first commandment in the large catechism uh, the, I mean you, you use the word cling which is especially prevalent in, in his uh, explanation of the first commandment there uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that this is the only word we can use. I yeah. mean, the first commandment has a lot to do with hope, I would say. And hope and trust are very uh, closely tied words, because what what, when you're trusting in something, you're hoping that this is going to deliver you. Just like this sinful woman believing in Christ, trusting in Christ, hoping in Christ. These, these are word families that, that all go together. But there in the large catechism, he talks about what the heart clings to. Yeah. And that, I mean, even to someone who isn't religious, the heart clinging to something probably has some resonance as trusting, dependence, reliance. I mean. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, uh, I translated an article by Oswald Bayer called Trust. And in that, he gets into how essential trust is. Yeah. We can't live a day without no. it. Uh, most of the things that we need to trust in to make it through the day, uh, eventually they'll fail us, and, and Christ doesn't. But yes, th this, this is how you don't, we don't want to be imposing religion on people. We want to find these things, the heart clinging. That's, right. that's certainly something that everyone understands. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have an online, Nick. Uh, this week's gospel, Lamb of God, is a reflection of the Passover lamb, not any of the sin offerings. The Passover lamb names the people of Israel. The Lamb of God names those who belong to God. In doing this naming, the word creates the reality of rightness, or maybe righteousness, outside of the law. I think this is the same as Romans 3, is it? Excellent. Precisely, yes. The Lamb of God, uh, I'm not trying to attack all traditional language that we use when talking about Christ's death on the cross. Christ pays a price for sin. This is, you know, we talk about a wide receiver going over the middle on third down. He pays a price for earning that first down. So we don't have to get rid of all this language altogether. The Lamb, the Passover Lamb, pays for the Jews' freedom with its life. And yet, this is not a legal sacrifice. It's not some debt that it's paying. It's giving its life for the sake of God's people. So yes, excellent uh, analogy there, and how even within the language of sacrifice, um, we can find things that are uh, better, have a deeper connection to what Christ is actually doing on the cross. Craig? Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for this talk about the blood and the mercy seat. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking uh, in the Torah, it says the life is in the blood. And then 
here in Hebrews, it says the blood of, of the blood of goats and sheep and things doesn't, doesn't suffice. And so is what that, going back to the very beginning with the, the life is in the blood, is that pointing toward what the, the blood, where the life really comes from, which is the blood of Jesus. You know, we kind of think of the life is in the blood as some kind of a, um, formula. But what they're really talking about, even back at the beginning, like the promises in the seed, um, that the life is in the blood, and that's already at the very beginning talking about the life is in the blood of, of Jesus. Certainly, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's happening, as you say, in a hidden way from the beginning in the promise of the seed. Now, Paul is saying God put forward Christ, he displayed Christ, depending on how you want to translate that word. So something is historically happening with the actual shedding of the blood, but the promise all along has been of Christ, and we didn't know it originally, but it relates directly to his blood. Um, and so the the Lord's Supper is the fulfillment of the promise to Eve. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. Yep, so 9 tomorrow morning we'll start and then and we'll have a break and then we'll have some brunch and then we'll begin up promptly again at 12, 12? Okay, all right, so that's our schedule for tomorrow. Thanks. Uh, 1, 1, 1.30. Good, thank you for coming.